Hey there everybody. So thanks for tuning in today. This is my new Chamonix 45N2. And uh, it's very similar to the Intrepid. So what I'm doing now is I'm zeroing it out. And like the Gen 5 Intrepid, it's now marked. Um, it's even easier than the Intrepid though, in the sense that it's got a hard stop on the back so you don't have to eyeball it. You just, you, here I'll show you what I'm talking about. So down here there's two hard metal stops. So you just open the camera up and it stops and it's at 90 degrees. And then, um, and then in the front everything's marked so you can zero everything out. So when you unfold a view camera, a field camera, like a Chamonix or an Intrepid or a Zone 6 or whatever, when you zero the camera out, and you, what you're doing is you're zeroing out all the movements, right? You can move the lens around. Well, when everything's at the zero position, your camera at that point is the same as any other camera, like this uh, Fuji X-H2 I'm using the film with. Like when you take a Fuji or a Sony or a Nikon or any of these cameras, modern digital cameras, out of your bag, they're all zeroed from the factory because they have no movements, okay? Um, the interesting thing about um, large format film camera is that it's mostly pretty much from the film plane forward, it's really your lens because this, the bellows, is actually your lens barrel, okay? Let me put a lens on here. So when I put a lens on my camera, it's missing, this is just the, the glass parts and the shutter and the aperture built into the, the lens part, okay? But um, now the shutter and the aperture would normally be in the camera body of your camera. Well, the aperture wouldn't, but the set the aperture would be in the camera body. So it's kind of a amalgamation of both lens and camera in the sense that, the large format camera, in the sense that the lens is only the glass bits. The bellows is the barrel of your lens that you would put onto your digital camera or your film camera, your smaller format cameras. So um, the really cool thing is these Intrepid lens boards fit the Chamonix uh, 4x5 better than they actually fit the Intrepid cameras. Okay, so if you get a Chamonix camera or, a, or if you get a 4x5 camera or a large format camera, so you've got all these um, movements right, in the camera, built into the camera. You can move the lens around. That's rise, that's fall, zero is zero, okay? That means no rise, no fall. <clears throat> you can only achieve that with a smaller format camera like a Nikon or a Canon or a Sony or a Fuji with a tilt shift lens if they make such a thing, okay? So inherent in every large format camera to the most, I'm speaking in generalities here, there's always the exception, but in generalities here, and in particular this um, Chamonix and the Intrepid and the Zone 6, uh, all of your view cameras are going to have, they're going to turn, all your lenses are going to be tilt, shift, rise, fall lenses, okay? And that's, uh, you, until you learn to use them, until you use them, you don't realize how great that capability is um, until you get to a camera with movements you don't you don't know what you're missing honestly okay it's a really cool thing I use it pretty much all the time when I'm shooting a view camera but I don't use it but obviously I don't use it when I'm shooting, uh, uh, you know, uh, my Fujis or a fixed lens in the sense that the lens that doesn't have any movements, okay? 
But when you first get started with the uh, with a view camera, the large format camera, like just zero it out and use it like any other normal camera. When it's zeroed, I can just point it at anything I want, okay, and just take the picture. I don't have to worry about the movements. All right, as long as it's zeroed and locked down, at that point, it functions like any other camera. It would be the same thing as if I want to take a picture of, this, of the grass down there. It's the same thing as if my Fuji was on here. I just take the picture and it'll be fine, okay? So when you get a large format camera, you don't have to use the movements. Don't get tripped up on that. If you want to get into large format and you have no idea how it works, just make sure the camera is zeroed out everywhere it can be zeroed, and just start using it, okay? All right, so there's really two stages to taking a large format photograph. The first stage, well, three stages if you consider setting the camera up like I just did, unfolding it, getting it all zeroed, putting your lens on of choice, that would be the first stage, okay? Your second stage I call the focusing stage, all right? So for the focusing stage and the composition stage, they're all one and the same. Now, the cool thing is the Chamonix comes with this really cool carbon fiber ground glass holder, which I really like. That is brilliant engineering and it saves your ground glass. The Chamonix also comes from the factory with a Fresnel with a really bright focusing screen, very nice. So, I'm going to lower this a little bit. So, in the second stage, which is the focusing stage and the composition stage, there's no film in the camera. The film slides in here, okay, between the ground glass, which is your viewfinder, and, um, and the camera so that when the film slides in here in the film holder it replaces it the exact position where the ground glass is so that's where that's why when you focus on the ground glass when you put the film in there it'll be focused on the film okay so this part of the camera this is your viewfinder like you would look on a camera a, a, a Fuji for example you're looking through the viewfinder, etc. This is this is more like the LCD on the back, except that it's a lot dimmer, and so that that's why you need a focusing cloth to cover or some kind of a shade to cover this up, so you can see the image and you can compose. And that's why we have a dark cloth. So if I put the dark cloth on here, crawl under there real quick and come up with a composition. I'm still learning this camera. And so the 135 millimeter lens is actually back a couple of places when you first set it up. The Chamonix is a lot smoother and a lot quicker to change where the position of the front standard. Um, the Length of your bellows is dictated by the laws of physics. Let me take this off and show you what I'm talking about. The length of your bellows is dictated by the laws of physics. If you have a 135 millimeter lens and you want to focus at infinity, you need to be 13.5 or 135 millimeters from the film plane to the nodal point to the, to the center of the lens. It's called the nodal point, kind of. So, um, so that's why, you know, that was a lot longer. The way I had it originally set up out here, it's a lot longer than 135 millimeters. This is like 13.5 centimeters, about yo. So that, this makes more sense. This will focus. So I quickly composed something and I quickly focused um, and uh, I'll show you what it looks like on the ground glass under the dark cloth. So that's what the image looks like. It's upside down and reversed. And once you're focused and composed, then you move on to stage three, which will be the metering and the actual taking of the photograph. 
So at this point, you can remove the dark cloth because that's not needed anymore. It's actually in the way. So now you take out your spot meter or your meter, incident meter, whatever, or you can even guess Sunny 16. Today I would say um, F16 at 125th at uh, ISO 100 speed film. Um, yeah, I'm going to put it at, uh, let's see, a stop for the semi-cloudiness and then a stop for uh, kicks and giggles. And I'd go three stops under today, so 16, 11, 8, 5, 6. And um, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16. So 8, 11, 16. I'd go F8. F8 at a, at a 125th would probably be pretty close. And uh, because you want to overexpose a little bit, I might do F8 at a 60th. Extrapolate that down because you want to use a smaller aperture for depth of field because you are shooting with a 135 millimeter lens, which is a wide angle on 4x5, approximately a 30 millimeter, 35 millimeter in full frame terms. But it's still 135 millimeter. And the depth of field is the same as 135 millimeter depth of field. So I would shoot this scene if I was actually shooting this scene at F32, F45, something like that, okay? So um, we will meter the scene. Take some spot readings here. Yeah, tenth of a second F32 for the bright areas, quarter of a second for the, sh uh, for the uh, shadow areas. So. Um, whatever that would work out to, what would I shoot this at? I'd probably shoot this at about um, an eighth of a second at f32, something like that, if, if I were actually taking the photograph. So, um, so now that we've done that, oh, one other thing. I would have also critical focused with a loop on the ground glass under the dark cloth. Um, so the next step in this dance, as Matt Maresh likes to call it, and it's exactly that, it's a dance. There's certain steps you have to go through every time. It's a lot quicker if I don't have to explain it to the camera. Uh, the next step in the dance is um, I usually, I, I could have put this on first, right? But So you're always shooting at an eighth of a second at le or less, so you always need a cable release to keep the uh, shutter shock down. On you mo all of your large format lenses that I've ever seen in these Copal shutters, you always have a lever here. And what that lever does is it opens your aperture so that you can focus, that's your focus lever. So there it would be open, that's letting light through the camera onto the ground glass so you can focus and compose. And then the next step, and this is crucial because if you leave that open, you put your film in and pull the dark slide, you killed your film, okay? So what's very important, the first thing to do is to shut that focus lever down. Now the lens is in shooting mode and not focus mode, okay? So we set an eighth of a second at F32, so we dial in our aperture on this back lever here, and then um, our shutter speeds are on here. Most of the time I'm shooting at like um, seconds, really. So I have to time it with a, time it with a stopwatch. But, um, but eighth of a second here is uh, what we said, so something like that. I'm making this up, right? I mean, I'm not really taking a photograph. But, um, so then the next thing you do, you cock your shutter because it's a mechanical shutter. I always test it. There it is, it works, cock it again. Now we're ready to shoot, okay? One of the ways, the, another good reason and a good habit to test your shutter like that is because when your shutter is cocked, if you're in focus mode, it won't work, okay? So that keeps you from having oopsies and wasting $2 sheets of film. Uh, or $8 sheets of film if it's color, with the price going up every day. I just saw today uh, Fuji is having a 13 to 80 percent, yeah, I read that right, 13 to 80 percent price increase on, um, on film. Yeah, well, enjoy it and shoot it while you can. So um, on that note, my color film of choice for slide film is now uh, E100. It's easy to get. It's, uh, it was a little bit more expensive than Fuji, but I don't think that's gonna continue. And, um, but it's easy to get. The Fuji films are so hard to get, you know, and I'm mostly a black and white shooter anyway. My black and white film of choice is Ilford FP4 Plus. 
But, um, but uh, yeah, Kodak, Kodak Ektar also. So for color, I'm using the Kodak films because it's just, I've had it with Fuji pulling the plug and then starting it up again and then yeah, ordering it special and all this nonsense. So there is that. Okay, so again, test your shutter. It's working. If your shutter's working, that means your focus lever is in the correct position to expose film. It's not in the focus position, it's in the shooting position. I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of beating this to death, but I'm trying to explain it to someone who's never seen a four x five or a large format camera before. So for all, your old hand, for all you old hands at this, my apologies if this is slow and I'm going through it and going over it a number of times. I'm trying to make it clear, okay. So uh, our shutter is now in, uh, is ready to go and our lens is ready to go and our camera is ready for film. So now we need film. I really like these Chamonix film holders. They're exquisite. Um, I label them so I know uh, which sheet of film is which. Uh, one of the things you can do also with large format that you, it's not as easy to do with any other format is you can process the film based upon the exposure. So on a very uh, contrasty day where the sun's really beaten down and casting harsh shadows, I can overexpose my film by a stop. In other words, so this is a 125 film. I rate it at 100. I would rate it at ISO 50. So I'm overexposing by a stop. And then I would pull the development and uh, develop it for 20% less. And that would even make a softer negative. It'll even out the harsh shadows. It's just something you can do. And it's easy to do when you're shooting one sheet at a time. Not so easy to do when you've got rolls, etc. cetera. So um, I, this, there is no film in here. Um, so what I would do is at home or in um, the back of my truck with my changing bag or changing tent, I would load this with film. So now there's film in there. The little Chamonix mark tells me that the film is uh, unexposed. When I expose the film, I will turn this around the other way. So uh, the first sheet will expose is 1A. W stands for wood because it's a wood film holder. So that goes in the back of the camera like so. It's really important to have the camera tightened down because when you are pushing this in, okay, lift the back out a little bit. Just slide it in, give it a little pull. All right, now obviously I wouldn't spin this around to do that, I'm doing it just to show you because the camera, once you've composed the image and once you've focused, you don't wanna move anything, all right? So then before, last thing I do before I expose the film is I make sure all my knobs are tight on the tripod, everything is tight, ready to go. Okay, camera's locked down, film holder's ready. Now, I would uh, twist the little lock here, so that's out. Pull the dark slide. Expose the film. I Notice I turned the dark side around, so that little Chamonix marking there is now on the inside, and so the black part of the film, hold, uh, film slide is, dark slide is lock the film. Let's put lock this one just for kicks and giggles. And just pull, you Basically, to get these out easily, you just pull it forward to get over the little bar and then pull it out. And there it is, that's an exposed sheet of film. There's no film in it, but it would be an exposed sheet of film if I were doing it. To uh, make a backup copy, I would take the, uh, turn it around, so now the side B is facing the lens. Okay, you can cock the shutter while there's film in the camera and then Pull the dark slide, take my second exposure, flip the dark side around, and very gently and carefully slide that in. And there we would have two exposed sheets of film. So why the Chamonix 4x5? Well, you know, I um, really enjoyed the Intrepid uh, because it's half the weight of my Zone 6. Uh, my Zone 6, which uh, originally when I started getting back into large format, my Zone 6 4x5, which I picked up uh, used, is solid brass and mahogany, and it weighs about six plus pounds. So uh, the Intrepid at 385 bucks and, uh, un and three pounds, I figured, well, let me give that a shot. So I picked up an Intrepid Gen 4, and it was fine. It's totally serviceable. They're good cameras, 
Um, they work. They're a little DIY in the sense that, you know, every once in a while you have to kind of fix something or whatever. But um, I've had problems with them and Intrepid has helped me every time. So uh, I don't know about before Gen 4, but, um, but definitely recently Intrepid's uh, customer service has been really good as far as I'm concerned. But um, uh, so much so that I picked up the Intrepid, I picked up a Gen 5 Intrepid because I thought it would be nice to have the uh, markings and some of the improvements that they made to it. And it is a very nice camera. The Gen 5 is a great camera, but um, it works fine. But, uh, and I also picked up the 8x10 Intrepid, which I think is a screaming value because uh, most um, 8x10 cameras are a thousand plus. The Chamonix Alpinist X is five grand. And uh, so, yeah, the Intrepid, uh, it's like $650. And that's to your door in the United States from uh, England. Uh, that's not bad at all for an 8x10, really. I mean, that's as cheap as it's going to get for a brand new 8x10. Even for a used 8x10, that's a great price. So I picked up the 8x10, and that's the first time I'd ever shot 8x10 because I wanted to try it and see what, uh, what it was all about. And um, it made me realize a few things about my large format uh, hopes, wishes, and desires. So 8x10 is a fantastic format, but it's every time you go up in a format, and that's the same with medium format, if you go 645 to 66 to 67, Things get incrementally more difficult and there's more compromises that need to be made. And the same is true with large format. Uh, going from 4x5 to 8x10, you lose a lot of capability, a lot of flexibility. It takes a lot more effort to, to achieve the same results. And what do I mean by that? Well, for example, um, I have uh, two different ways to enlarge 4x5 negatives. I have, I have the copy stand with the Intrepid enlarger back. And then I've got a Bessler 45 enlarger that I picked up um, off a of Craigslist for 300 bucks. So, um, for, and, and it fits in my small, tiny, limited space darkroom. To enlarge 8x10 negatives, that's going to require, you know, a, a larger darkroom <laughs> to make a long story short. If I'm shooting color, the results are the same in the sense that, like, I really don't enlarge my own color. I don't develop my own color uh, film. So I would send it off to a darkroom. I would scan it and print it digitally like Ben Horn does. I can scan my 8x10 negatives and print them digitally, uh, my black and white negatives as well. So in a way, not having the darkroom capabilities isn't that big a deal. Uh, the other thing is, is like when I shoot 4x5, I, I get four, I can process four sheets of film at a time. With uh, the 8x10, I can only process one sheet of film at a time. So, you know, it, uh, processing 4x5 black and white film is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, much more efficient for 4x5 than it is for 8x10. And then, the, then there's the uh, lens limitations in the sense that, like, um, I could pull off 240 millimeter to 450 millimeter without too much of a problem. And I already have the 240, I have the 300, I would need to buy the 450. Um, but that is a limited range compared to what I already have for 4x5, which I go 90, 135, 210, and 300. So, you know, uh, the lens selection, I would like to add a 75 to my 4x5 kit, and I'd like to add the 450 that would also work with my 4x5 kit for the 8x10. So there's interchangeability there, but what I'm trying to say is standardizing on 4x5 is kind of an easy choice. You're getting a lot of the, well, you're getting all of the large format benefits without the um, limitations of 8x10. Okay, there's the weight factor. Um, the Intrepid is one of the lightest 8x10s that I've ever heard of, and it's six plus pounds. That's just for the camera. The film holders are, you know, you, you pack three 8x10 film holders and you could have brought 12 sheets of 4x5 film with you. So, and you're get, you're, with 4x5, you're still getting that fantastic large format film quality in your images. So having said all that, the eight, buying the Intrepid 8x10 made me realize that I really enjoy 4x5 as a field format. And I kind of like it to make it my film format of choice. And if I were going to do that, okay, what camera would I want to use 
for that. And I said to myself, what I really want is a little higher quality Intrepid. Enter the Chamonix. And um, Chamonix makes different models. They make the F2, they make the N2, et cetera. They make the H, whatever. Um, the H is out because that's fixed. It doesn't, it's kind of an odd camera. Um, I, I honestly, I don't really understand it. I mean, uh, there's something it does that the other cameras don't, but I didn't really need it, so I kind of dismissed it. The F2 is a little bit more technical of a camera than the N2, but I just wanted a basic 4x5 camera for my field work because I know how I work and I know what I do. I've been shooting 4x5 for a long time, so I know what I want in a 4x5 camera. Um, I, the, the rear movements aren't that important to me as long as it has some basic ones, which the N2 does. I do use rise a lot, and I do use the front tilt a, a, quite a bit um, for various reasons. Uh, but other than that, you know, so, so the N2 was the right camera for me. And in a way, it's a little smaller than the Intrepid uh, somehow. It is like three ounces heavier, no big deal. It's like 3.4 ounces for the Chamonix and the Intrepid is like 3.1 ounces. So, yeah. Um, and the uh, Chamonix 4x5 was only like $1,255. That's FedEx shipped to my door included in that price. And FedEx got it there in five days from, I think it was somewhere outside of Shanghai, China to Oregon. That's, that's you can't ask for more than that. So, so far, I, I haven't used the Chamonix yet, but I can tell already it's exactly what I wanted. It's a higher level Intrepid. It kind of functions exactly the same, but everything's just a little smoother, a little bit more refined, or maybe a lot more refined, a lot smoother. The t it's the right combination of modern materials and traditional materials. I love the teak. I love the carbon fiber. I love the gray metal. Uh, gun, gun metal, anodized, uh, aluminum, stainless steel, etc. Chamonix really did a beautiful job. There's real craftsmanship there, and I'm very impressed with the camera so far. So, so that's, in a nutshell, as, as, as trying to hit all the high points without making it too long of a video, um, how uh, my field camera works, how, why uh, 4x5 is my film format of choice, and uh, why I chose the Chamonix, and why I bought the Chamonix. So, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. If you found this helpful at all, please subscribe, like the video. It really helps me out a ton, and I really appreciate it. So, um, we'll see you out there. Have a great one.